Sit down, dear fellow, sit down, spread out the cloak. Antonov, the cade it was Rostov. With one hand he supported the other. He was pale and his jaw trembled, shivering feverishly. He was placed on Matbevna, the gun from which they had removed the dead officer. The cloak they spread under him was wet with blood which stained his breeches and arm. What? Are you wounded? My lad, said Tushin, approaching the gun on which Rostov sat. No, it's a sprain. Then what is this blood on the gun carriage? inquired Tushin. It was the officer. Your honor stained it, answered the artilleryman, wiping away the blood with his coat sleeve, as if apologizing for the state of his gun. It was all that they could do to get the guns up the rise aided by the infantry, and having reached the village of Gruntersdorf, they halted. It had grown so dark that one could not distinguish the uniforms ten paces off, and the firing had begun to subside. Suddenly, nearby on the right, shouting and firing were again heard. Flashes of shot gleamed in the darkness. This was the last French attack and was met by soldiers who had sheltered in the village houses. They all rushed out of the village again, but Tushin's guns could not move, and the artillerymen, Tushin, and the cadet exchanged silent glances as they awaited their fate. The firing died down and soldiers, talking eagerly, streamed out of a side street. Not hurt, Petrov, asked one. We've given it em hot. Mate, they won't make another push now, said another. You couldn't see a thing. How they shot at their own fellows, nothing could be seen. Pitch dark, brother, isn't there something to drink? The French had been repulsed for the last time. And again and again, in the complete darkness, Tushin's guns moved forward, surrounded by the humming infantry as by a frame. In the darkness, it seemed as though a gloomy unseen river was flowing always in one direction, humming with whispers and talk and the sound of hoofs and wheels. Amid the general rumble, the groans and voices of the wounded were more distinctly heard than any other sound in the darkness of the night. The gloom that enveloped the army was filled with their groans, which seemed to melt into one with the darkness of the night. After a while the moving mass became agitated, someone rode past on a white horse followed by his suit, and said something in passing. What did he say? Where to now halt? Is the whole moving mass began pressing closer together, and a report spread that they were ordered to halt. Evidently those in front had halted. All remained where they were in the middle of the muddy road. Fires were lighted and the talk became more audible. Captain Tushin, having given orders to his company, sent a soldier to find a dressing station or a doctor for the cadet, and sat down by a bonfire the soldiers had come. Rostov, too, dragged himself to the fire. From pain, cold and damp. A feverish shivering shook his whole body. Drosinus was irresistibly mastering him, but he kept awake by an excruciating pain in his arm, for which he could find no satisfactory position. He kept closing his eyes and then again looking at the fire, which seemed to him dazzlingly red, and at the feeble, round-shouldered figure of Tushin, who was sitting cross-legged like a Tushin's large kind, Intelligent eyes were fixed with sympathy and commiseration on Rostov, who saw that Tushin with his whole heart wished to help him but could not. From all sides were heard the footsteps and talk of the infantry, who were walking, driving past, and settling down all around. The sound of voices, the tramping feet, the horses' hoofs moving in mud, the crackling of wood fires near and afar, merged into one tremulous rumble. It was no longer, as before, a dark, unseen river flowing through the gloom, but a dark sea swelling and gradually subsiding after a storm. Rostov looked at and listened listlessly to what passed before and around him. An infantryman came to the fire, squatted on his heels, held his hands to the blaze, and turned away his face. You don't mind your honor? He asked Tushin. I've lost my company, your honor. I don't know where. Such bad luck. With the soldier, an infantry officer with a bandaged cheek came up to the bonfire, and addressing Tushin asked him to have the guns moved a trifle to let a wagon. 
after he had gone, two soldiers rushed to the campfire. They were quarreling and fighting desperately, each trying to snatch from the other a boot they were both holding on to. You picked it up. I dare say, you were very smart, one of them shouted hoarsely. Then a thin, pale soldier, his neck bandaged with a blood-stained leg band, came up and in angry tones asked the artilleryman for water. Must one die like a dog, said he. Tushin told them to give the man some water. Then a cheerful soldier ran up, begging a little fire for the infantry. A nice little hot torch for the infantry. Good luck to you, fellow countrymen. Thanks for the fire, we'll return it with interest, said he, carrying away into the darkness a glowing stick. Next came four soldiers, carrying something heavy on a cloak, and passed by the fire. One of them stumbled. Who the devil has put the logs on the road? snarled he. He's dead, why carry him? said another. Shut up! And they disappeared into the darkness with their load. Still etching, Tushin asked Rostov in a whisper. Yes. Your honor, you were wanted by the general. He is in the hut here, said a gunner, coming up to Tushin. Coming, friend. Tushin rose and, buttoning his greatcoat and pulling it straight, walked away from the fire, not far from the artillery campfire. In a hut that had been prepared for him, Prince Begration sat at dinner, talking with some commanding officers who had gathered at his quarters. The little old man with the half-closed eyes was there greedily gnawing a mutton bone, and the general who had served blamelessly for twenty-two years, flushed by a glass of vodka. In a corner of the hut stood a standard captured from the French, and the accountant with the knave face was feeling its texture, shaking his head in perplexity perhaps because the banner really interested him. In the next hut there was a French colonel who had been taken prisoner by our dragoons. Our officers were flocking in to look at him. Prince Bagration was thanking the individual commanders and inquiring into details of the action and our losses. The general whose regiment had been inspected at Brano was informing the prince that as soon as the action began he had withdrawn from the wood, mustered the men who were woodcutting, and, allowed, when I saw your excellency, that their first battalion was disorganized, I stopped in the road and thought, I'll let them come on and we'll meet them with the fire of the whole battalion. Perhaps it might really have been so. Could one possibly make out amid all that confusion what did or did not happen? By the way, Your Excellency, I should inform you. He, can, he had not seen the Hussars all that day, but had heard about them from an infantry officer. They broke up two squares, Your Excellency. Several of those present smiled at Shirkov's words, expecting one of his usual jokes, but noticing that what he was saying Prince Begration turned to the old colonel. Gentlemen, I thank you all. All arms have behaved heroically. Infantry, cavalry, and artillery. How was it that two guns were abandoned in the center? He inquired, searching with his eyes for someone. Prince Begration did not ask about the guns on the left flank. He knew that all the guns there had been abandoned at the very beginning of the action. I think I sent you, he added, Turning to the one was damaged, answered the staff officer, and the other I can't understand. I was there all the time giving orders and had only just left. Eh, eh, er, all, only easy, hang It is true that it was hot there, he added modestly. Someone mentioned that Captain Tushin was bivouacking close to the village and had already been sent for. Oh, but you were there, said Prince Bagration, addressing Prince Andrew. Of course, we only just missed one another, said the staff officer, with a smile to Balkanska. I had not the pleasure of seeing you, said Prince Andrew coldly and abruptly. All were silent. Tushin appeared at the threshold and made his way timidly from behind the backs of the generals. As he stepped past the generals in the crowded hut, Feeling embarrassed as he always was by the sight of his superiors, he did not notice the staff of the banner and stumbled over it. Several of those present laughed. 
How was it a gun was abandoned? asked Bagration, frowning, not so much at the captain as at those who were laughing, among whom Shirkov laughed loudest. Only now, when he was confronted by the stern authorities, did his guilt and the disgrace of having lost two guns and yet remaining alive present themselves to Tushin in all their horror. He had been so excited that he had not thought about it until that moment. The officer's laughter confused him still more. He stood before Bagration with his lower jaw trembling and was hardly able to mutter. I don't know. Your Excellency. I had no men. Your Excellency. You might have taken some from the covering troops. Tushin did not say that there were no covering troops, though that was perfectly true. He was afraid of getting some other officer into trouble, and silently fixed his eyes on Bagration as a schoolboy who has blundered looks at an examiner. The silence lasted some time. Prince Bagration, apparently not wishing to be severe, found nothing to say. The others did not venture to intervene. Prince Andrew looked at Tushin from under his brows, and his fingers twitched nervously. Your Excellency, Prince Andrew broke the silence with his abrupt voice. You were pleased to send me to Captain Tushin's battery. I went there and found two-thirds of the men and horses knocked out, two guns smashed, and no supports at all. Prince Bagration and Tushin looked with equal intentness at Vulcan's, and, if Your Excellency will allow me to express my opinion, he continued, we owe today's success chiefly to the action of that battery and the heroic endurance of Captain Tushin and his company. Prince Bagration looked at Tushin, evidently reluctant to show distrust in Balkanskai's emphatic opinion, yet not feeling able fully to credit it, bent his head and told Tushin. Prince Andrew went out with him. Thank you. You saved me, my dear fellow, said Tushin. Prince Andrew gave him a look but said nothing and went away. He felt sad and depressed. It was all so strange, so unlike what he had hoped. Who are they? Why are they here? What do they want? And when will all this end? Thought Rostov, looking at the changing shadows before him. The pain in his arm became more and more intense. Irresistible drossness overpowered him. Red rings danced before his eyes and the impression of those voices and faces and a sense of loneliness merged with the physical pain. It was they, these soldiers wounded and unwounded, it was they who were crushing, weighing down, and twisting the sinews and scorching the flesh of his sprained arm and shoulder. To rid himself of them he closed his eyes. For a moment he dozed, but in that short interval innumerable things appeared to him in a dream. His mother and her large white hand, Sonia's thin little shoulders, Natus, that affair was the same thing as this soldier with the harsh voice, and it was that affair and this soldier that were so agonizingly, incessantly pulling and pressing his arm, and always dragging it. In. He tried to get away from them, but they would not for an instant let his shoulder move a hair's breadth. It would not at you, it would be well, if only they did not pull it, but it was impossible to get rid of them. He opened his eyes and looked up. The black canopy of night hung less than a yard above the glow of the charcoal. Flakes of falling snow were fluttering in that light. Tushin had not returned. The doctor had not come. He was alone now, except for a soldier who was sitting naked at the other side of the fire, warming his thin yellow body. Nobody wants me, thought Rostov. There is no one to help me or pity me. Yet I was once at home, strong, happy and loved. He sighed and, doing so, groaned involuntarily. He is anything hurting you? Asked the soldier, shaking his shirt out over the fire, and not waiting for an answer he gave a grunt and added, what a lot of men have been crippled. He looked at the snowflakes fluttering above the fire and remembered a Russian winter at his warm, bright home, his fluffy fur coat, his quickly gliding sleigh, his healthy... And why did I come here? He wondered. Next day the French army did not renew their attack, and the remnant of Bagration's detachment was reunited to Kutuzov's army. Book 3, 1805 Chapter I Prince Vasily was not a man who deliberately thought out his plans. Still less did he think of injuring anyone for his own advantage. 
He was merely a man of the world who had got on and to whom getting on had become a habit. Schemes and devices for which he never rightly accounted to himself, but which formed the whole interest of his life, were constantly shaping themselves in his mind, arising from the circumstance. Of these plans he had not merely one or two in his head but dozens, some only beginning to form themselves, some approaching achievement, and some in course of dis. He did not, for instance, say to himself, This man now has influence, I must gain his confidence and friendship, and through him obtain a special grant. He had Pierre at hand in Moscow and procured for him an appointment as gentleman of the bedchamber, which at that time conferred the status of counsellor of state, and insisted on the young man accompanying with apparent absent-mindedness, yet with unhesitating assurance that he was doing the right thing. Prince Vasily did everything to get Pierre to marry his daughter. Had he thought out his plans beforehand, he could not have been so natural and shown such unaffected familiarity in intercourse with everybody both above and below him in social standing. Something always drew him toward those richer and more powerful than himself, and he had rare skill in seizing the most opportune moment for making use of people. Pierre, on unexpectedly becoming Count Bezukhov and a rich man, felt himself after his recent loneliness and freedom from cares so beset and preoccupied that only in bed was he. He had to sign papers, to present himself at government offices, the purpose of which was not clear to him, to question his chief steward, to visit his estate near Moscow. These different people, businessmen, relations, and acquaintances alike, were all disposed to treat the young heir in the most friendly and flattering manner. They were all evidently... He was always hearing such words as, with your remarkable kindness, or, with your excellent heart, you are yourself so honorable, Count, or, were he as clever as you, even people who had formerly been spiteful toward him and evidently unfriendly now became gentle and affectionate. The angry eldest princess, with the long waist and hair plastered down like a doll's, had come into Pierre's room after the funeral. With drooping eyes and frequent blushes she told him she was very sorry about their past misunderstandings and did not now feel she had a right to ask him for anything, except only for permission. She could not refrain from weeping at these words. Touched that this statuesque princess could so change, Pierre took her hand and begged her forgiveness, without knowing what for. From that day the eldest princess quite changed toward Pierre and began knitting a striped scarf for him. Do this for my sake, Moncher. After all, she had to put up with a great deal from the deceased, said Prince Vasily to him, handing him a deed to sign for the princess. Prince Vasily had come to the conclusion that it was necessary to throw this bone, a bill for thirty thousand rubles, to the poor princess that it might not occur to her to speak of his share in the affair of the inlaid. Pierre signed the deed, and after that the princess grew still kinder. The younger sisters also became affectionate to him, especially the youngest, the pretty one with the mole, who often made him feel confused by her smiles and her own confusion when meeting. It seemed so natural to Pierre that every one should like him, and it would have seemed so unnatural had any one disliked him, that he could not but believe in the sincerity of those around him. Besides, he had no time to ask himself whether these people were sincere or not. He was always busy and always felt in a state of mild and cheerful intoxication. He felt as though he were the center of some important and general movement that something was constantly expected of him, that if he did not do it he would grieve and disappoint many people, but if he did this more than anyone else. Prince Vasily took possession of Pierre's affairs and of Pierre himself in those early days. From the death of Count Bezukhov he did not let go his hold of the lad. He had the air of a man oppressed by business, weary and suffering, who yet would not, for pity's sake, leave this helpless youth who, after all, was the son of his old during the few days he spent in Moscow we start tomorrow and I'm giving you a place in my carriage I am very glad all our important business here is now settled 
and I ought to have been off long ago. Here is something I have received from the Chancellor. I asked him for you, and you have been entered in the diplomatic corps and made a gentleman of the bedchamber. The diplomatic career now lies open before you. Notwithstanding the tone of wearied assurance with which these words were pronounced, Pierre, who had so long been considering his career, but Prince Vasily interrupted him in the special deep cooing tone, precluding the possibility of interrupting his speech, which he used in extreme cases when special persuasion was needed. Mais, mon cher, I did this for my own sake, to satisfy my conscience, and there is nothing to thank me for. No one has ever complained yet of being too much loved. And besides, you are free, you could throw it up tomorrow. But you will see everything for yourself when you get to Petersburg. It is high time for you to get away from these terrible recollections. Prince Vesely sighed. Yes, yes, my boy. And my valet can go in your carriage. I was nearly forgetting, he added. You know, Monsieur, your father and I had some accounts to settle, so I have received what was due from the Ryazan estate and will keep it. You won't require it. We'll go into the accounts later. By what was due from the Ryazan estate, Prince Vasily meant several thousand rubles quitrent received from Pierre's peasants, which the prince had retained for himself. In Petersburg, as in Moscow, Pierre found the same atmosphere of gentleness and affection. He could not refuse the post, or rather the rank, for he did nothing. That Prince Vasily had procured for him, and acquaintances, invitations, and social of his former bachelor acquaintances many were no longer in Petersburg. The guards had gone to the front. Dolokov had been reduced to the ranks. Anatole was in the army somewhere in the provinces. Prince Andrew was abroad. So P his whole time was taken up with dinners and balls and was spent chiefly at Prince Vesely's house in the company of the stout princess, his wife, and his beautiful daughter Helene. Like the others, Anna Pavlovna Skir showed Pierre the change of attitude toward him that had taken place in society. Formerly in Anna Pavlovna's presence, Pierre had always felt that what he was saying was out of place, tactless and unsuitable, that remarks which seemed to him clever while they formed. Now everything Pierre said was charmant. Even if Anna Pavlovna did not say so, he could see that she wished to and only refrained out of regard for his modesty. In the beginning of the winter of 1805, six Pierre received one of Anna Pavlovna's usual pink notes with an invitation to which was added, You will find the beautiful Helene here. Anna Pavlovna's at home was like the former one. Only the novelty she offered her guests this time was not more to marked, but a diplomatist fresh from Berlin with the very latest details of Anna Pavlovna received Pierre with a shade of melancholy evidently relating to the young man's recent loss by the death of Count Bezukhov, everyone constantly considered it a duty to assure Pierre felt flattered by this. Anna Pavlovna arranged the different groups in her drawing room with her habitual skill. The large group, in which were Prince Vasily and the generals, had the benefit of the diplomat. Another group was at the tea table. Pierre wished to join the former, but Anna Pavlovna, who was in the excited condition of a commander on a battlefield to whom thousands of new and brilliant ideas occur which there is hardly to go and keep her company for ten minutes, and that it will not be too dull, here is the dear Count who will not refuse to accompany you. The beauty went to the aunt, but Anna Pavlovna detained Pierre, looking as if she had to give Isn't she exquisite? She said to Pierre, pointing to the stately beauty as she glided away and how she carries herself, for so young a girl, such tact, such masterly perfection of manner, it comes from her heart. Happy the man who wins her, with her the least worldly of men would occupy a most brilliant position in society. Don't you think so? I only wanted to know your opinion, and Anna Pavlovna let Pierre go. Pierre, in reply, sincerely agreed with her as to Helene's perfection of manner, if he ever thought of Helene, it was just of her beauty and her remarkable skill in appearing silently dignified in society. 
the old aunt received the two young people in her corner, but seemed desirous of hiding her adoration for Helene and inclined rather to show her fear of Anna Pavlovna. She looked at her niece, as if inquiring what she was to do with these people. On leaving them, Anna Pavlovna again touched Pierre's sleeve, saying, I hope you won't say that it is dull in my house again, and she glanced at Helene. Helene smiled, with a look implying that she did not admit the possibility of anyone seeing her without being enchanted. The aunt coughed, swallowed, and said in French that she was very pleased to see Helene. Then she turned to Pierre with the same words of welcome and the same look. In the middle of a dull and halting conversation, Helene turned to Pierre with the beautiful bright smile that she gave to everyone. Pierre was so used to that smile, and it had so little meaning for him, that he paid no attention to it. The aunt was just speaking of a collection of snuff-boxes that had belonged to Pierre's father, Count Bezukhov, and showed them her own box. Princess Helene asked to see the portrait of the aunt's husband on the box lid. That is probably the work of Vinus, said Pierre, mentioning a celebrated miniaturist, and he leaned over the table to take the snuff-box while trying to hear what was being said at the other table. He half rose, meaning to go round, but the aunt handed him the snuff-box, passing it across Helene's back. Helene stooped forward to make room, and looked round with a smile. She was, as always at evening parties, wearing a dress such as was then fashionable, cut very low at front and back. Her bust, which had always seemed like marble to peer, was so close to him, which his short-sighted eyes could not but perceive the living charm of her neck and shoulders, so near to his lip, he was conscious of the warmth of her body, the scent of perfume, and the creaking of her corset as she moved. He did not see her marble beauty forming a complete whole with her dress, but all the charm of her body only covered by her garments. And having once seen this, he could not help being aware of it, just as we cannot renew an illusion we have once seen through. So you have never noticed before how beautiful I am, Helene seemed to say. You had not noticed that I am a woman. Yes, I am a woman who may belong to anyone to you too, said her glance. And at that moment Pierre felt that Helene not only could but must, be his wife, and that it could not be otherwise. He knew this at that moment as surely as if he had been standing at the altar with her. How and when this would be he did not know. He did not even know if it would be a good thing. He even felt he knew not why, that it would be a bad thing, but he knew it would happen. Pierre dropped his eyes, lifted them again, and wished once more to see her as a distant beauty far removed from him, as he had seen her every day until then but he could no longer do. He could not, any more than a man who has been looking at a tuft of steppe grass through the mist and taking it for a tree can again take it for a tree after he has once recognized it to be a tuft of grass. She was terribly close to him. She already had power over him, and between them there was no longer any barrier except the barrier of his own will. Well, I will leave you in your little corner, came Anna Pavlovna's voice, I see you are all right there. And Pierre, anxiously trying to remember whether he had done it seemed to him that every one knew what had happened to him as he knew it himself. A little later, when he went up to the large circle, Anna Pavlovna said to him, I hear you are refitting your Petersburg house. This was true. The architect had told him that it was necessary, and Pierre, without knowing why, was having his enormous Petersburg house done up. That's a good thing, but don't move from Prince Vesely's. It is good to have a friend like the prince, she said, smiling at Prince Vesely. I know something about that. Don't I? And you are still so young. You need advice. Don't be angry with me for exercising an old woman's privilege. She paused, as women always do, expecting something after they have mentioned their age. If you marry, it will be a different thing, she continued, uniting them both in one glance. Pierre did not look at Helene nor she at him, but she was just as terribly close to him. He muttered something and collared. When he got home, he could not sleep for a long time for thinking of what had happened. 
What had happened? Nothing. He had merely understood that the woman he had known as a child, of whom when her beauty was mentioned he had said absent-mindedly, Yes, she's good-looking. He had understood. But she's stupid. I have myself said she's stupid, he thought.